chapter 28 to begin with. Matthew chapter 28. We read here in Matthew 28 verse 18 that Jesus, after his resurrection, comes up and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now let's stop there for a moment. We're listening to someone here who has all authority, not just on earth, that would be enough, but also in heaven. So these words must be listened to. These are from one who has all authority in heaven and on earth. Verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So this one that has all authority has commanded three things here. Number one, make disciples. Number two, baptize them. Number three, teach them to observe all that I have commanded. If we go over to Acts chapter 2, the disciples obeyed the authority of Jesus. Let's go to Acts chapter 2, because we find here in Acts chapter 2, they preached the message about Jesus and people came to believe in the message. And so down in verse 37, when the people had heard this message and they'd come to believe that Jesus was the Christ, they said in verse 37, Acts 2 verse 37, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Now what's Peter going to answer here? Is he going to say, well, Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth, but I'm not going to listen to what he says. I'm going to make up my own answer here. No. Have a look at verse 38. What does he do? He says, Repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Exactly as Jesus had commanded. The disciples went out, taught the people, made disciples of them, and as we go down to verse 41, those who had received his word were baptised, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. So 3,000 were baptised that day. So you can see just how important that message was and how the disciples followed through and obeyed Jesus' instructions. Well, what about today? Just about all the... Uh, denominations around us today, and I'm talking about Catholic and Anglican and Baptist and so on, they all practice something they call baptism. But uh, I would suggest this morning that we need to have a good look at what Jesus meant here by baptism. Because uh, while these denominational people have submitted themselves to something they call baptism, is it the baptism that we find Jesus talking about in the New Testament. <clears throat> Most uh, denominations, uh, we'll find out I hope this morning, are not practicing the one baptism that's referred to in Ephesians 4 verse 5. I'm not going to get you to take my word for it, I'm going to prove it to you this morning from the scriptures. And the reason I thought it'd be good to go over this again is that we need to tell people what the scriptures are saying. We'll see at the end of the lesson how important it is that people know what the scriptures are actually saying and whether they've done it or not. Baptism's a very important topic. It's uh, the word uh, baptism and its associated words are uh, referred to it over a hundred times in the New Testament. And because baptism's so commonly misunderstood in our community, it's not remiss of us to keep emphasizing and teaching the truth on this important subject. So I've entitled my lesson this morning, Some Things Wrong with Denominational Baptisms. Some Things Wrong with Denominational Baptisms, and I'd like to have a look at three things this morning. And the first of those things that I want to look at this morning is that denominational baptisms often involve the wrong person. The wrong person is baptised in uh, these denominations that surround us. Now, before I give you examples of this, I want us to have a look at what the Bible teaches first about who should be baptised, and then we'll have a look at the wrong practices that uh, happen today. First of all, uh, let's have a think about 1 Peter 3, 21 and 22. And I've got a few passages this morning, so we'll turn some up and I'll have some up here that we can have a look at. The first thing we need to understand according to the Scriptures, 
that uh, baptism now saves you, it's an appeal to God for a good conscience. So when people are baptised, they need to be appealing to God for a good conscience. They need to know that what they're doing is what God wants them to do, and they want to be right with God. But notice this, if you're appealing to God for a good conscience, that means you have to have faith before you're baptised. You've got to have faith that there is a God. You've got to have faith that this is uh, part of his word and it's pleasing to him. So in a moment, we're going to have a look at what denominations do wrong. But for the moment, let's notice that baptism only saves us if we have faith in God before we're baptised. If we continue on, Mark 16, verses 15 and 16. Jesus taught, go into all the world, preach the gospel to all creation. But notice again, he who has believed and been baptised shall be saved. So again, you see, you've got to have belief before you're baptised if you're going to be saved. We could look at many of these, but uh, let's have a look at just one more. Colossians 2 verse 12. Having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God. So this is what the Bible's teaching you, see. If you're going to be baptised, one important aspect of that is you've got to have faith. We've already read from Acts 2, you've also got to have repentance, of course. But these are things that must go or must happen before you're baptised. If we have a look at some examples in the New Testament, let's have a look at one of those. In Acts chapter 12, we find that uh, when people believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God, so here we are again, they believed the message they heard, and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptised. Notice again, they believed and they were being baptised. Men and women alike, not just the men of course, men and women alike. Even Simon himself believed and after being baptised he continued on. So that's what the scriptures are teaching and you can't get any clearer than that. That if you're going to be saved you have to believe, repent and be baptised and belief and repentance come before baptism. Now, let's leave the Bible for a moment and I hate doing that because we should be here to look at the Bible and the Bible only. But I'm going to go into some historical details now and as always when we go into history because this is not scripture, because this is not the word of God I'm presenting now, I'm only going to do it for a couple of seconds so don't get too worried. Because it's not scripture, any of the statements that I now make may be wrong. So treat this with a lot of care and caution. We're not looking at the scriptures now, we're looking at history. And what we find from history is this. About uh, 200 AD, the practice of baptising infants was introduced and was vigorously opposed at the time. Now, if you want to track some of the history about this, you can go to these various uh, sources, uh, Tertullian, Origen, Hippolytus, and so on. You can check this out. But around 200 AD, some bright spark got the idea, well, let's go and baptise babies, infants. Now, can you see what's wrong with that? If we go back to what the scriptures have taught, the scriptures, as we've seen, have taught that you have to have belief. You have to repent before you're baptised. That's what the scriptures say. And yet around 200 AD, you see, these people decided that, no, we're going to include now baptising infants as well. And that's the first thing wrong, you see, with denominational baptism today. When infants are being baptised, they've got the wrong person being baptised. What happens, of course, is that uh, if we have a look at uh, today in the various denominations, we find that uh, Catholic, Anglican, Lutheran, Uniting Church, I don't know, might be others as well, are now baptising infants. I want you to stop for a moment this morning and just have a think about that. Where's uh, Josiah this morning? I don't know if you can see Josiah. He's lying down on the floor over there. He's only a few months old. I want you to have a think this morning as you look at baby Josiah over there. What sins does he have that need to be forgiven? He doesn't have any sins. He has no sins at all. Now, some people say he has sins. He has the original sins that came when, when Adam passed on his sin to others. Well, that's a load of baloney. Let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 18. What does God say about passing on sins? In Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20. Notice very carefully here. The person who sins will die. 
the son will not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity. How could all of us be born and by virtue of being born have the taint of Adam's sin? That's, that's a man's fable, a man's story. Because we're told here very clearly, the son will not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity. If we have a look at the end of verse 20 there, the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. You can't transfer wickedness to someone else like that. They can't be punished for your wickedness. So we need to understand this morning that infants have no sin. They have no taint from Adam. That's a, that's a man-made fable. There's no need for an infant to be baptised because they have no sins. And if we look at these scriptures again, which infant who's baptised believes before they're baptised? Now, apparently, I was christened as a baby. Now, of course, I've got no recollection of that, no idea about it whatsoever. The only reason I've got some inkling about what happened is because my parents told me many years later. Did I have faith when I was baptised? I don't even remember whatever happened, whatever did happen. There's no way you see that infants can have faith before they're baptised and there's no need for them to be baptised because they have no sins. So uh, when we look at uh, our lesson for today, some of the wrong practices in the denominations, we need to remember. Number one, denominational baptisms often involve the wrong person. Baptising infants, babies, that's baptising the wrong person according to these scriptures. Let's have a look at a, uh, a second point. And the second point here is that denominational baptisms often involve the wrong method. The wrong method, not just the wrong person, but the wrong method. And what I'd like us to think about here is that uh, the word baptism itself means immersion. It means being plunged into water and being raised up again. That's what the word means. In fact, I brought a couple of Bibles in today, and you might be aware of these, the complete Jewish Bible and the Tree of Life version, which is also a Jewish Bible. In both of these Bibles, in Matthew 28, verse 19, where our Bibles have making, uh, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, guess what these have? The Jewish Bibles, the people that know the languages. They have immersing them. Immersing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's what baptism is. The word means immersing. It doesn't mean sprinkling, and it doesn't mean pouring. In the Greek, there is another word that does mean uh, pouring. John 13, verse 5, Jesus poured water into a basin. There is a Greek word for pouring. There's another Greek word for sprinkling. In Hebrews 9, verse 19, Moses sprinkled both the book and the people as well with the blood. So we've got words in Greek for sprinkling and pouring, but immersion, baptism, is uh, the word for being immersed. Baptism is immersion. And so uh, let's this morning notice that uh, baptism uh, involves the wrong method in many of the denominations. What we're going to see this morning is that baptism is a washing in water, it's a burial, it's performed by going down into the water and coming up out of the water. And don't just take my word for it, let's have a look at a few of these scriptures. John 3 verse 23. Now this is John's baptism of course, not baptism in the name of Jesus, but notice here John was baptising in Enon near Salem because there was much water there. Now I've got a question for you. Why was much water needed? If baptism was sprinkling or, or pouring, wouldn't you just need, I don't know, a well or, a, or a, 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 some kind of a container of water? Wouldn't that suffice? But no, when they were baptising, they were baptising because there was much water there. Baptism, you see, the word means immersion. You've got to have plenty of water so you can immerse people in that water. In Acts chapter 8... The eunuch wanted to be baptised. He ordered the chariot to stop and they both went down into the water. Philip as well as the eunuch and he baptised them and they both came up out of the water. Now why would two of you go down into the water to sprinkle someone or to pour a bit of water on them? Surely you go down into the water so that one can be immersed in the water and then you both come up out of the water after that's happened. Let's keep going. Acts chapter 22 verse 16. Paul was told to get up and be baptised and wash away your sins. It's a washing. 
In Hebrews 10 verse 22, it refers to our bodies being washed with pure water. Our bodies. That's immersion. It's not sprinkling and it's not pouring. In uh, Colossians 2 and Romans uh, 6, notice here that baptism is likened to a burial. We are buried in the water, so to speak, and you rise up again to walk in a new life. It's a burial, uh, both in Colossians 2 and Romans, to walk in a new life. Well, that's what the scriptures teach. And again, I'm going to be a bit naughty this morning. I'm going to leave the scriptures for a moment. And I'm going to go back through history and see what uh, we can find in the history of what happened over the years. So again, I'll emphasize this morning that this is a historical section. And what I say in this section may or may not be correct. So uh, take it with a, a pinch of salt. But I've given you a few references here and you can check this if you want. In the first few centuries, after the time of the Apostles, baptism was almost always regarded as immersion. And you can check out these authorities anytime you want, Hermas, Didash, Tertullian, and all of these kind of... And this is the first few centuries after the time of Jesus and the Apostles. What happens? Well, about 140 AD, some teachers stated that people could have water poured on them if baptism couldn't be performed. I don't know what excuse they came up with, but they came up with some situation where perhaps someone couldn't be immersed in water. So in that case, it was okay to have water poured on them instead of them being immersed. But it's interesting that as late as 252, uh, sorry, 250 AD, this practice was widely questioned. Uh, Cyprian, Eusebius, and so on. So someone again, some bright spark had introduced this about 140, so okay, let's introduce pouring now for those awkward cases where someone can't be immersed. But even by uh, 250 AD, this was still very, being very widely questioned. <clears throat> Later on, of course, and this is what we find today, that uh, the meaning of the word baptism has changed. Now, if you look up a dictionary for baptism, you'll find pouring and sprinkling, uh, as well as immersion. Our, our words have changed over the centuries. But if you look back at the Bible, it's very clear that baptism is an immersion. What do we find today? The practice of sprinkling or pouring occurs today in Catholic, Anglican, Lutheran, Uniting Churches and so on. Again, these are errors. These are mistakes that uh, religious people are making today. And it's our second mistake for today that uh, not only are people baptizing the wrong people, but they're using the wrong method. Baptism is immersion in water, not sprinkling and not pouring. Well, let's go on to our third and uh, final uh, problem with denominational baptisms. And the third one for today is denominational baptism often involve the wrong person. Not only the, uh, the, wrong, uh, the sorry, wrong purpose, not only the wrong person and the wrong method, but also the wrong person. Now, before we commence here, I need to uh, get you to turn with me to Romans chapter 5. I don't want anyone to misunderstand this morning the importance of Romans 5 verse 9. In Romans 5 verse 9, much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Of paramount importance in our salvation is the blood of Jesus. And there's no way that anyone can be saved without the blood of Jesus. I want to emphasize that this morning. But the issue this morning is, of course, when is that blood applied to us? When does that blood become effective in us so that our sins are forgiven? Well, as we're going to see this morning, that's the purpose of baptism. That's the time when, when we're united with the blood of Jesus to have our sins forgiven. So let's have a look at a few scriptures that will show that to us. Let's go first of all back to the ones that we've looked at already. Mark 16 and uh, 1 Peter 3. We'll see that it's uh, by baptism. That's the time when we're saved. That's when our sins are forgiven or washed away. That's when we're clothed with Christ and that's when we enter the kingdom of God. So Mark 16, 16. He who has believed and is baptised shall be saved. That's when you're saved. That's when the blood of Jesus becomes effective in your life. It doesn't say here, he who believes shall be saved and then they get baptised. It doesn't say that at all, does it? 
Look at the order here. You believe, you're baptised, then you're saved. That's the order of the scriptures. Let's have a look at 1 Peter 3. Uh, talking about Noah corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. That's when you come in contact with the blood of Jesus. It's not anything magical about the water and the baptism. But that's the time at which you're showing God. You're appealing to him for a good conscience. That's the time you're showing God you're obeying his command. And that's the time you come in contact with the blood of Jesus. The water doesn't save you. It's the blood of Jesus. But you're only saved when you're baptised because you're obeying the commands of God. We've already seen this morning in Acts 2 verse 38. Peter said, uh, repent and be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ. Now notice again. For the forgiveness of your sins. We're going to see in a moment that many denominations have got the wrong purpose for baptism. Many denominations today are saying you're already saved and if you want to, sometime down the track you can get baptised if you like. Well, that's not what Jesus is saying in the apostles or the scriptures. In Acts 22 verse 16, you get up and get baptised and you wash away your sins. And notice this, you don't delay. Once you realise that you've got to be baptised in order to be saved, to have your sins forgiven, you don't mess around. You get on with the job. Get it done. Wash away your sins. In uh, Galatians 3 verse 27, those who've been baptised into Christ have clothed themselves with Christ. You're not clothed with Christ until such time as you're baptised in water. Now this is not me making up some rules. You can read that for yourself. It's there in the scriptures in black and white. And we must follow what God is telling us. In uh, John 3 verse 5 and 1 Corinthians 12, Jesus said it's by water and the Spirit that you enter the kingdom of God. In 1 Corinthians 12, we're all baptised into one body. We know the body is the church from other scriptures, Colossians 1 verse 18 and so on. And we know of the church that Jesus himself is the saviour of the body. If you want to be saved, you've got to be in the body. You've got to be in the church. And the way to get into the church, you see, is you're baptised into the body of which Christ is the saviour. I mean, words couldn't be plainer, could they? And so again, I hope you'll forgive me this morning. I'm going to leave the scriptures for a moment and I'm going to track back into history. And again, I'm going to emphasise that anything I say in this section may or may not be correct. You need to check it and uh, establish whether it's right or wrong, but uh, I'll give you some references if you're interested. And the uh, first of these, the first point I want to make here is that uh, before at least 350 AD, it was universally taught that sins are forgiven through baptism. No dispute whatsoever. And again, many references you can look up, Justin, or Irenaeus, uh, Tertullian, and so on. Before at least 350, it was universally taught that, uh, that sins are forgiven through baptism. So what happened then? Well, around AD 360, some people taught that martyrs might be saved without having been baptised. So again, can you see what happens? Some bright spark sits down and thinks, well... Maybe there are a couple of people that might, have an opportunity, might not have an opportunity to be baptised. Who knows how many opportunities they may have given up before that time, but that's not the point I'm making here. Some bright spark said, well, OK, uh, let's, uh, let's say that people can be saved without baptism. Let's say that some can, some special cases, some martyrs. Um, however, even then, most of the religious writers continue to maintain that baptism in water was always necessary for salvation. Uh, John Chrysostom and so on. So can you see the way things change down through history? Very sadly, God's word gets neglected and uh, changed over time. What do we find about 1500 AD? Along comes John Calvin and a few others, and then it becomes frequently taught that unbaptized people may be saved. Until we get to the horrible situation we've got today where there are even people saying that all you need today is faith. Faith only is what saves you. You don't need to repent. You don't need to be baptised. Different to what we read in the New Testament, but that's what some people are saying today. And this began about 1500 AD. What do we find today? Almost all the Protestant denominations deny that baptism in water is important for salvation. They teach that one is saved prior to any baptism. Is that what Jesus and the apostles taught? Of course it's not. There are many scriptures, and I haven't looked at all of them, but many scriptures uh, repent, be baptised for the forgiveness of your sins. Who are you going to believe this morning? Are you going to believe the Apostle Peter, 
Christ's chosen apostle with the other apostles? Or are you going to believe John Calvin or some of the false teachers today that say all you need is faith? Well, I'm going to put my money on the uh, chosen apostles because I want to get to heaven. I know their word is uh, irrefutable. It's uh, inspired by God and it's the truth. And that's what we should be following today. And so uh, we've had a look at three problems with denominational baptism. The wrong person, they baptise babies. Uh, the second point, the wrong method. They use sprinkling and pouring on occasions. And thirdly now, we've seen they have the wrong purpose. The purpose is for forgiveness of sins and salvation. I'd like us to have a look at a fourth point this morning. Does it really matter? Does it matter if you use sprinkling instead of immersion? Does it matter if you baptise a baby instead of an adult? Well, uh, let's have a look at Leviticus 10. I'll, I'll see if you can answer this question for yourself. Leviticus chapter 10. In Leviticus chapter 10, we're going to read verses 1 and 2. And we're reading here about uh, the two sons of Aaron called Nadab and Abihu. Now these were priests in those days. They would have had the priestly garments on and they were performing worship to God. And they were offering uh, to God uh, worship. Let's read Leviticus 10 verses 1 and 2. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans and after putting fire in them, placed incense on it. Now notice this. And offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. God hadn't commanded what they were about to do. Even though they were dressed in their priestly garments, even though they were offering him worship, it wasn't what he had commanded them. Look at verse 2. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. So I'll ask you again this morning. Does it really matter? whether we do God's will or not? Well, certainly for them it mattered. They offered strange fire which God hadn't commanded and they were struck dead for it. You know, we live in Australia today where a lot of times the attitude is near enough's good enough. As long as you get close, that's all you want. Well, that's not what God's saying. God says, if I give you my word, I expect you to obey it. We're not going to turn these passages up this morning, but Matthew 15, verses 7 to 9. If you follow the teachings of men, you worship me in vain, says Jesus. Galatians 1, verses 6 to 9. If anyone comes to you and preaches a gospel different to this one, let him be accursed. 2 John 1, verses 9 to 11. If anyone goes too far and doesn't abide in the teaching of Christ, he doesn't have God. Don't welcome him. Don't receive him. I mean, words couldn't be clearer. It does matter. We're not wasting our time here this morning talking about these things. These things do matter. And so uh, let's turn to Acts chapter 19. What we need to remember is that we need to tell this to people and we need to remind people that if they've been christened as a baby, which they probably don't even remember, or if they may have been sprinkled instead of immersed when they were baptised, or perhaps they thought they were saved before they were baptised, whatever the, the reason, if they haven't done what we've read about in the Scriptures, they haven't been baptised properly. They haven't been baptised in the name of Jesus. And what they need to do, of course, is to be baptised in the name of Jesus. Let's have a look here in Acts chapter 19, because here we had some people that had been baptised with John's baptism, but now, of course, they had to be baptised in the name of Jesus. Acts chapter 19, uh, let's take it up from uh, verse 3. Paul asked these people, into what were you baptised? And they said, into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptised with a baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in him who was coming after him, that is in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. Well, that's the principle for today. If we haven't been baptised in the Lord Jesus, the name of the Lord Jesus, even though we might have been baptised in some other way, well, let's get baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. John's baptism doesn't occur today, of course, but if I was sprinkled instead of immersed, or if I was christened as a baby and not baptised as an adult, or any other uh, one of the... If I was baptised thinking I was already saved before I was baptised, then we need to be baptised properly in the name of Jesus this morning. <coughs> I don't want to say too much more about the topic this morning other than to remind you that we have a responsibility to point these things out to people. What they do with it is up to them, of course, 
But if we're going to present the truth, we need to show people exactly what the scriptures teach on this important topic. Let's finish where we started this morning, back in Matthew 28. The one who gave us these words, remember in Matthew 28, verse 18, is the one that has all authority in heaven and on earth. Are you going to defy that authority this morning? Are you going to say, no, I'm not going to listen to that authority? It's by that authority that he said in verse 19, go therefore, one, make disciples of all the nations. Two, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you and lie with you always, even to the end of the age. Let's not get caught up with denominational errors. Let's come out of denominations and follow just the scriptures and just the truth of God. And this morning we extend the invitation to any who haven't yet been baptised in the name of Jesus. Having believed first and repented, being immersed in water, not just sprinkled or, or poured on, for the purpose of having your sins forgiven, then we urge you, let us know today and we can arrange baptism for you right here and now. For those of us this morning that have been baptised in the name of Jesus, let's remember that we need to continue on faithfully until the end, serving the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth. Let's now ask Carl to lead us in the last song.